Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Back End Bear Podcast, where we discuss anything related to programming, algorithms, and the latest practices in the coding world. So sit back, grab a drink, enjoy, and let's dig right into it. How's it going, people? Hope you're having a great start of the week. This is just a short introduction. This is one of the first interviews I've done with Jared Porcinellic. I had a lot of fun. We talked about IoT, we talked about software development, we talked about his famous Bronco project. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and trust me, this is a great interview. Thank you, Jared, for being a guest. And we're live. <laughs> How's it going, people? Hope you're having a great start of the week. And today we're kicking it off with an interview. And my guest is someone who is a loud voice in the Orlando community. He's a strong supporter of IoT and organizer of Internet of Things meetups, um, a charismatic ticker, Microsoft's most valuable player. He's a DevOps aficionado. And um, a true inspiration, the one, the only, Jared Porcinellic. <laughs> wow, that was quite the intro. I did not see that coming. Okay, I uh, am also just a regular human like you, listener, and uh, I happen to write code for a living, which is also, I hope, probably, you know, what the listener, you listener are doing too. So uh, I'm going to bring that back down a little I am all those things. I also uh, make mistakes and have to Google things all the time and I'm a normal person as well as all of those things Marco so graciously <laughs> said. So uh, happy well, to be on your podcast. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you liked the intro. So, uh, and it's yeah. true. I mean, whatever, all of the things I said is true. So you can you tell me a bit about yourself? So where are sure. you now? What do you do? And uh, how do you do it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How do you get uh, all the time? <laughs> sure. Well, my professional self, uh, I'm a software developer. I work at a, a company called, uh, let's see, what's the date today? I work for a company called Nebia Technology, a new signature company. And what that means is I used to work for a company called Nebia Technology, and we got acquired by a company called New Signature. And until, I believe, July 1st, the name is Nebia Technology, a new signature company, and July 1st, it switches over to just being new signature. So uh, we're kind of in an interim place where, you know, we got acquired by a bigger company. So, but anyway, um, I'm a software developer. The company I work for, whether or not it's Nebia or new signature or whatever, like the, what I do and what the team I work closely with does is a lot of consultation and hands-on work in the world of DevOps and Azure. And um, it's such a big space, and sometimes it's hard to explain the concepts, but basically I help people get stuff done faster and better because like, that's what I think the value of DevOps is, and that's the value of Azure. Like, when it comes to DevOps, being able to write code and get it tested and get it approved and get it deployed in a short amount of time in a reliable way, like that's kind of the crux of that. And then with Azure, like if you're still doing on-prem stuff and you have to um, order a physical server to show up and, and install in a rack, like the amount of time it takes for that to happen compared to like spinning something up in the cloud uh, is incredible. So, you know, that's what, that's what the focus of what we do is, is making stuff happen faster and better, basically. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. I mean, I'm kind of in a similar boat. And at least with DevOps, I the project now I'm working on at the moment because we're mixing it up, we're switching it a bit based on what we need at the moment. But the last project I'm working on, it's a bit of a, how should I say? Um, it's a bit of a stretch um, and management doesn't yet know what exactly they want. So DevOps in that case would be perfect because like here, here's an application running around. Here's a search form or something that they are interested in. You know, and then based on their feedback, I can 
you know, create something out of it and improve it with every iteration, right? Mm -hmm. And push push a new thing, which is great. Um, and I'm having, I'm enjoying it a lot lately because before that I was mostly in Agile, but enough about me. But um, what got you into programming? Um, so by accident, I did not intend to get into this field and I actually started in college at UCF with a, uh, trying to do film. Um, and what really interested me about that is like the human connection and being able to tell stories and get people to laugh or cry. Like, I think that's a very powerful medium. And, um, but or I also felt- corrupt him, But it can also like take away lives. So that's like, we need to be very cautious what we're, developing and there's a very like at least i feel very proud of what i'm doing and i'm very meticulous about details and about my coding so i would be like because it's programming is a big science to me so it's it's really like close to my heart so yeah uh, can you expand on that a little it's a big science what did you say um so um, i'll um I, I take responsibility in the code mm. that I write. So that's, I want to stand behind it and I want to say 100% sure, yes, this code is absolutely safe or this code absolutely works yeah. the way it's intended to be, not nothing, you know. Yeah. So in that way, yeah, sorry about my language. So I mix up no, it's, <laughs> it's, every once in a while, but yeah. As long as you don't mind me asking once in a while to clarify, that's all. Yeah. I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. So. So I was started out in film and then I realized like it's all been done before in some way, like uh, the masters out there of film are really, really good. And like, I realized I wanted to kind of do something where not everything has been explored. And I felt very constrained by the screen. You know, there's a mm -hmm. only so big, only so many pixels, only so many things you can show on it. So, um, I got into digital media and I thought my impression of digital media as a major was like combining the software and the hardware and making like new experiences for people, um, almost like an art, an art form. That was my impression when I walked into the door. But my first class was in like a JavaScript intro class. And that class was so it was very boring and like half the people already knew what they're doing and half the people, including myself had no idea. And like the half the people that knew they were doing, they didn't even have to take the final because like they already had like such good grades. They just, the, the professor was basically like, if you have over an A, you don't have to take the final. And of course, like I had an 89% because you know, that's just how it goes sometimes. And so anyway, I felt very discouraged because it took me like an hour in the labs and some people would walk out after like, 10 minutes and I'm like, what am I doing here? So I switched majors again to video production and that's what I graduated with. But um, through a series of unusual events, I got into web development. Um, I got a job at a company that sold restaurant equipment and I worked in their web development department. And I was like, I don't know how to do this basically. And they're like, that's okay, we'll teach you. And it turned out it was very like, very basic stuff. It was it was data entry pretty much, just putting numbers in and around HTML, not really touching the HTML. But uh, in fact, I worked there for like a year and a half without even knowing HTML or JavaScript or CSS or any of those like front end um, things in web development. Even though I looked at it all day every day, and I think that that's that's what made me like fall into it a little bit more easily at that point because I had been seeing it for so long. But there's just like one moment in time that got me hooked. And that was when um, I had to change a date on the bottom of a page every year, like a copyright date. And um, it wasn't just one page, there was like 30,000 pages across these static HTML sites. Yeah, you, yeah. So I nuts. know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, well, I'm sorry you know exactly what I'm talking about because it's awful, um, but I didn't know it was awful. How could I know it was awful? I had nothing to compare it to. And so a friend of mine showed me a little JavaScript snippet that would basically change that date to be the year every year automatically based on the local, like, 
computer that someone's using to see the website. And like, there's so many concepts that I had to grasp very quickly to understand what that single line of code did. Like I had to understand it was client side. Like I had to understand it's not going to be, if someone's local computer has 2005 as the date, that's what date is going to be shown on the page. And I like it to me, that blew my mind. Like, I'm like, wait, so hold on. Like if it's wait and like simple things like that. And I say simple retrospectively, like looking back, that is an e that is a concept I know well now. Like that is second nature now. Like there's a client side, there's a server side. You know, some things happen in the client, some things happen in the server. You know, but looking back on it, that was such a difficult concept for me to grasp because I it's just a different world. I just I wasn't taught that. You know, like I was taught about playing soccer. I was taught about learning math. I was taught taught about how to drive, I was not taught about how data moves through a system and, you know, it was just a crazy world. But once I learned that, it kind of got me hooked because I saw the real world benefit. And then I, from then on, I was um, very hungry and very eager to continue learning. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed. Like, I'm impressed how detailed of a memory you have like about that. Well, I, 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 When I think about it, I don't even know, like, that detail what got me into programming. So that's like impressive and commendable. I mean, I, I want to kind of go back to one thing because, uh, and I even wrote it down when you mentioned like programming is an art form. And that's so funny because on the last episode, I was just talking about that. Whereas making a parallel between like, okay, uh, imagine uh, two writers writing a novel, right? So, and I'm trying to make a parallel with the clean code. So Two, uh, two writers writing a novel, they have the same topic, but writing the novel. They would write the novel differently, right? Both of them have different ways of expressing emotions and cells. Yes, the plot twists are the same, everything, the character is the same, but the way they all get to the point is different. So, and that's the point of clean code. So choosing one path of those, so everyone will understand the, the same metaphors, like and you know so and that's that's what kind of brought me back like into it and it, that's great i mean uh, i'm super glad about it so i'm right about one thing and and the way i look at code like as well um so speaking of code like um uh, how how important like are coding standards to you do do you guys you know obsess about the rules or do you set the standards or do you just go like mm. Well, okay. I think the all over the place. <laughs> um, I think the bigger the team, and especially the more dispersed, like a lot of remote teams. Um, like if you have a remote team, if you have people who are not sitting side by side each other, I think it's even more important to have coding standards. Um, I'm not a big stickler for them. I think they're useful. I think they can be very useful. I think it's most useful if it's. Uh, enforced by like your IDE or something like that and can be overwritten. Like some things I've seen where people are not allowed to check in their code to source control or commit to like Git unless it meets the code standards. Like to me, that's a little heavy handed. Like we want to encourage, I want to encourage my team members to write better code. And I want my team members code not to look too different from mine so that from a practical perspective, I can read what they wrote and they can write, read what I wrote. And for the most part, I don't think we have to be creative in that area. Like if I'm writing C sharp, there's naming conventions and standards for C sharp from Microsoft. And while they may not explain everything, something like, um, you know, SQL or, whatever, like auto formatter or whatever built into Visual Studio, that'll that'll tell tell me when things don't look right. Or if you really want to get in there, like ReSharper or something like that, which is a plugin for Visual Studio, which is an IDE if you're not in the .NET Microsoft world, it's a you know integrated development environment. So so I think tools help enforce standards. And if you're trying to just write standards and argue about it um, without a use of a tool to like nudge people toward a good direction, there's going to be a lot of time spent 
you know, in code reviews saying, this doesn't look how I think it should look, go rewrite this. And then you have arguments and like, it's just better to have a tool to kind of enforce it, but not strictly enforce it. So it'll warn you like it doesn't fit, but not like, you know, burn you at the stake basically if it doesn't meet the same standards. Yeah, the, the, that's one of the issues I'm facing with lately. Uh, I mean, yes, we have the resharper. We put it in. There are rules enforced, like the default rules. So it's not even anything crazy that we can enforce our developers. But I'm still running into issues where developers are not like sticking to the naming conventions, sticking uh, uh, the way they like uh, atomize things. So let's say split up a function to smaller functions. So it's read more readable chunkable so and i'm trying but most of my team is juniors now so i'm i'm trying you know to get them up to speed with that so that's you know some junior mistakes but yeah that's one of the issues i'm facing off lately and like dealing with um emotions yeah that yeah uh, also also one one of uh, sorry going a bit sidetracked but uh one of the things i'm getting into lately is that People portray me, um, they're scared of me. Let me put it like that. Because I kind of, I don't know, the way I set myself up and the way that I jump on them, explain that something's wrong. I was trying to explain them like, look, uh, here's a counter example why your thing doesn't work. So you need to fix it, rewrite it. So it would you know, work in that case, right? Yeah. But they're kind of scared of me because of <laughs> that. So I'm working on that uh, at the moment and trying to improve that communication with them. Um, and that the way I find that out is like talking with the management because they they're never gonna tell me that, right? Because like, you know, mm. you're some like guy with you know foreign accent, like you know, not screaming at them, but like, you know, ordering them around. So that's that's one of the, the, the issues I'm kind of facing lately. It, um, it's only a foreign accent if you live in a certain place. Well, yeah. <laughs> but um which brings me to my next question. How do you deal with bad code? Oh boy, bad code. That's so that a, that I want to find out. Like, how yeah, do you deal with it? <laughs> well, it's like bad writing, right? It's up to the yeah. eye of the reader. I think um, for the most part, people can read a book, and you know, that's why we have Goodreads, right? Like, you go on Goodreads. I don't know if you do this. I go on Goodreads and I look at the books and like I see my friends have starred like five stars or four stars, and you see, and I see those books that are like three stars and i think people are just being nice and it's like well if I, i'm not going to read a three-star book it's probably bad but if you look at the reviews on that some people think it's extremely good and i think that that speaks to the subjective nature of code or of writing in general and i think code like you're saying you know there's a lot of parallels to writing i don't think that it's great it's not a perfect metaphor there's no perfect metaphor and the reason it's not a perfect metaphor is because at the end of the day there are benefits or detriments to not only how the human reads the code but how the computer reads the code because i can write the code you can write the code it could look very different but at the end of the day it let's say we're writing c sharp um in we could write different looking code that boils down to the same code on in the light layer underneath you know in the intermediate language um and at the same time we could write code that looks somewhat similar to humans but let's say i use some nested for loops and you don't and the computer treats that very differently and they and it might take a lot longer to run or use a lot more memory or you know whatever else and so i think we're fighting a battle um of what bad code means because there's um subjective stuff like what it looks like to a human and then there's objective stuff which is what it looks like to the computer and it's much easier i think to talk about the objective stuff this code is slow or than we want it to be or whatever or this code doesn't build like that's clearly red green <laughs> yeah. either builds or doesn't build and then, you know, uh, we could get into unit tests and things like that. Like, does it pass the test? Mm -hmm. I can write some ugly code that passes the test, quote unquote. Like, and I can write some very pretty code that doesn't pass the test. So 
there's just so many factors and there's so many things that different people value that I don't, I, I almost don't even like the term bad code because it's so subjective. Like, what is the goal of this code? What is the goal that we have? And then let's talk about if we're meeting it or not meeting it. And let's talk about what it looks like. And let's talk about if it's easy to maintain. Let's talk about if it's tested. Let's talk about the different elements that make up quote unquote good code. Like code smell, bad code, just throwing these terms out there, I think is, um, you know, something that doesn't necessarily help junior devs. Like if we're talking about junior developers, mm -hmm. because if we just stop at good code or bad code or that's ugly or I, I don't know, that's a code smell. Like we're not talking about the merits or, or demerits of what it is we're actually trying to do. And I think it takes some, some emotion out of it if we can just say, hey, um, you know, this is using a lot of memory and here's why. Or, hey, you could write this in less lines and here, you know, less lines of code. Or you can expand this into more lines of code and make it more human readable by you know, building up variables that I can read as a human and not trying to like fit a bunch of code that the computer understands, but I don't understand on one line. Like having those conversations about specifics, removing the term good and bad from our lexicon and trying to make, you know, shine a light on someone as like the shining example of a programmer and, and really just like bury somebody or throw them under the bus because they didn't write something well to our standards. Like, I think that goes a long way to starting to pull out the emotion and start to talk about the actual thing we're both trying to solve. Like uh, we're on the same team. Yeah, um, I mean, what I'm trying to do usually is uh, when I'm like looking at code, I'm trying to make it like maintainable and portable. And by maintainable, I mean, because people change, people change nonstop. Like, uh, I mean, at least in my company, like developers are fluctuating nonstop. So I have to deal with that. And I want developers jumping in to understand where things are and it's a, probably a bit of my OCD as well like on the thing like I want things in a certain place like you know define mm -hmm. class properties mm -hmm. here define functions here define, define them like that so you know uh, try to keep uh, separation of concerns you know and stuff like that so try to explain those terms that that's what I'm kind of trying to do with them that's my only goal like trying to make it maintainable and portable we all make mistakes we're all gonna write like bad code or bad code in a way that's not executing good or bad or, you know, we all have our days. I mean, I have my, what I like to call like a deer in the headlights, like you're doing on something and you can't think of it right then and there. So I'm gonna like, okay, I'm gonna try to do something else, you know, take a walk, <laughs> I don't know, come back tomorrow and, you know, mm -hmm. with a fresh pair of eyes <clears throat> and you'll you'll do better like this. Uh, one, one thing I keep in mind is I think everybody's trying their best. Um, and so, whether it's lack of experience or a different set of values. Like you said, you like things to be portable. Um, maybe someone else is writing code not to be portable, but to be extremely fast, uh, right? Um, and th those things aren't always at odds, but sometimes they could be. And uh, um, <clears throat> like I said, I think just keeping in mind that people are trying their best and even junior developers, like it, I can, think back in my career, like I wrote terrible code at some point. I still probably write terrible code to someone else's standards. Like, so just being a little empathetic and, and understanding and realizing like when you see a piece of code, I don't understand what went into it. Like I just see the, the output. So what was the person thinking when they were creating it? Maybe they only had 30 minutes to write this thing before they had to go home and, you know, pick up their kids from daycare. I, I don't know. So having those human conversations about it and having some empathy and just talking through it, I think those things lead to just better code in general, if we're going to, you know. Yeah, that. that's good advice. And I'm trying now to be more like empathetic and flexible on that. And, you know, I'm trying to talk it way through with them. So I'm not you know, the boogeyman. I don't want to be the boogeyman. I want yeah. to be like the guy who helped you out. Like, you know, I want to make you excel in your career. Like, you know, this is like, yeah. you want to be a medium developer or mid developer or now developer too. Now there's numbers is the thing, mm -hmm. but uh, like, you know, I'm going to help you. You want to be a senior. I'm going to help you with that too. So I even have like literature, whatever you want, like I can help you out. So 
Well, what, one of the things I think is diff very difficult for someone such as yourself or someone like me who has more experience, there's somebody, all, you know, there's always somebody out there with more experience, but yeah, that's for sure. It, sure. it's been like seven years since I started doing software development. And I think when I started, I had a lot of emotion because I had a lot of pride and a lot of hubris, like because I was just starting out, I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was new, but everything I heard was like, you must, you know, the, the thought leaders, thought leaders out there, like you must do this. And if you don't do this, it's not good. And, you know, all these like heavy handed opinions and I just like sunk them in. I'm like, well, if we don't do this and this is bad code and all this code I'm seeing that doesn't do this, we need to refactor it, all of it right now. It's so bad. Why are we not doing, we need to move from web forms to MVC today, you know, cause web form sucks. MVC is so much better. But like if I had to try to mentor my younger self, I don't know how successful I'd be because I'm, pretty headstrong and opinionated and, and especially back then. And I think um, that's difficult because as a, as someone who could mentor someone else, like um, junior devs don't know what they don't know and can be headstrong in general. And opinionated and have a lot of pride and so like if something doesn't isn't meeting let's say you're working with a junior dev and it doesn't meet their standard like it doesn't meet your standard what they're writing doesn't meet your standard like that hurts right like i i want to be seen as important i want to be seen as competent and if i don't be if i'm as a junior dev not being seen as that like it hurts and and i could get defensive and be like you know well, you're wrong, you know, basically. And, and so I think the human element of that, and not just you, this goes for every mentor, mentee, software development relationship, every manager or lead developer and every junior developer, like I see it happen. I've been there on both sides of that coin and, you know, after years of experience, I think just, just trying to keep in mind everybody trying their best is so help, helpful in handling situations like that. But quick question, like corporate or non-corporate setting? Both. Uh, well, mostly corporate. Or I think non startup, I mean, that's corporate or startup setup. So. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think startups are more, I don't know. I don't think I have enough experience. It's very strange. The company I work for now is you know started out like we were like five people and it had a very startup um feel but we worked with a lot when we still worked with a lot of corporate clients so internal it was you know we didn't have to have a lot of process but the companies that we work for do have a lot of process and have bigger teams with junior you know senior relationships and stuff like that so um, I feel like in quote unquote startup culture, people are more forgiving for some reason. I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it's like every, every side has their positives and negatives, right? So, yeah. And I don't know. I mean, personally now I'm in the corporate structure. So now I'm liking that, but I'm still, you know, I'm still liking some sides of it, but I don't like the other side of it. So, you know, there's like positives and negatives in every system, but just what suits you the best. That's in a way like the best answer we can give for that. Um, so we talked about this, but one thing I want to talk about is your Bronco project. What can you tell me about that? I was so amazed when I listened to it, like on, on, on the last minute, what was it? It was, DevOps, Orlando? No, what was it? I forgot. It was in Orlando. Yeah. It was at the uh, um, Disney. So, so I got as far like, and unfortunately, I haven't worked on it lately. I have worked on. I just got a house like last year, and I've been working on a lot of house projects. But, but hang on, I let's have, let's let's take it from the start. So, 
for people who never heard of sure, it. Like, sure. just give them an overview of like what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, what is what is it? It's um. So I have a 1988 Ford Bronco too. It's a 30 year old truck, and uh, it's a piece of crap. Um, if I were to be honest, it's I bought it for seven hundred and fifty dollars, and uh it's like pimp my ride at the beginning you know what i'm saying like <laughs> uh, uh, exhibit needs to show up and kind of just take this away from me but um that's a that's a reference to a certain generation um anyway the thing's a piece of crap and i had an issue with it where i couldn't tell if it was overheating or not because the temperature gauge would just ping uh all the way up to hot all the time and either that was true and my truck is some sort of miracle or the temperature gauge just didn't work correctly and i needed to fix it so uh i assumed my truck was not some sort of heaven sent uh mechanical miracle and so i went to the store like part store and got a temperature gauge like off the shelf and put it in there, and it was really cheap, and it was mechanical. Uh, in fact, there's no electrical signal in this gauge at all. It, it, you, what you do is you screw a metal thing into the engine block, and it attaches to a tube, a, a rubber tube, and the tube goes up to a gauge in the truck. And in that tube is a gas, and that gas, when it heats up, pushes the needle in the gauge, and it tells you how hot the engine is. And it's very inaccurate. So, like, I'd drive around for, like, 10 minutes, and the gauge wouldn't move. And in 10 minutes, if you have no coolant, that could be very bad. So um, I did, wasn't happy with that. And so I wanted to work in my – I wanted to make a – my own solution because I am a tinkerer. So I started on this journey and looking back, maybe I would approach it differently, but I think that goes to, that's how it is with any project. Um, but I'm looking at it right now, actually. Uh, I can show you. Uh, 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 uh. Well, the audio people are like, well, who cares? You know, but <laughs> so yeah, this will be on YouTube as well, so you can. Oh, okay, good. So you can check it. <laughs> they can check yeah, it out. It sounds, and sounds see. very physical to the people who are not on the uh, radio listening in their commute. So, or the it sounds very physical to those people. I hope they really get an audio adventure out of this. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, like you can see the sensor. I'm just going to show you the sensor. So I got the sensor. Um, like halfway through the project because I prototyped it with an off-the-shelf sensor that you can just plug and play into a Raspberry Pi. So basically, I have a Raspberry Pi. I want to read temperature. How do I read temperature? Okay, um, well, it's got these pins on it called GPIO. It means general purpose input output. The idea is that you can plug anything into it. So normally a computer, you'd just be able to plug in like a keyboard and a mouse and whatever else USB things you can find, but with a Raspberry Pi, because it has these extra ports or pins, you can plug in temperature sensors, uh, LED lights, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff, which is what makes a Raspberry Pi, in my opinion, so cool and so much cooler than any other like regular cheap computer you can buy. Because I think I think there's a misconception or like people view Raspberry Pis as like, oh, I can get a cheap small computer and I can put a Linux on it and I can game on it or whatever. Yeah, that's cool. That's you know, it is cheap. It's like forty bucks or whatever. But if you're only gonna buy it to like run it as a small computer, you're missing half the fun because there's there are ports available that are not available on like an Intel Nook or whatever else. Like you can't, you know, like the, that's the power I think of a Raspberry Pi. And I think a lot of people miss that. So anyway, I have a Raspberry Pi and I'm probably gonna break a bunch of wires trying to show it to you, but whatever. 
so this is this is the little project. Uh, it's kind of a mess right now. But on the Raspberry Pi, there's these GPI opens. You can plug temperature sensors in or whatnot. Um, you can put on a Raspberry Pi, and I did this to prototype, a hat. And a hat basically is another board um, with like a, like a little tiny motherboard, PCB or a printed circuit board, and you slap it on top of the Raspberry Pi, and the GPIO pins line up with the pins on this hat. And so I, um, the purpose of a hat is to kind of extend the functionality of a Raspberry Pi or whatever else you use. And I have a hat from a company called Seed, and they make up uh, something called Grove. And their Grove product is basically like, if you don't know anything about voltage, if you don't know anything about, um, you know, wiring stuff up, use this because you can just plug a hat on top of your Raspberry Pi, it'll plug into the GPIO, and then you can take sensors that they give you with their own connectors um, and just plug and play. So you just plug them in. You don't have to worry about worrying about voltage or anything like that. And then you can prototype or more accurately proof of concept an idea so i had a humidity slash temperature sensor i think it's a dht 11 or something like that um and i plugged it into the hat and i plugged the hat into the raspberry pi and seed the company that makes the hat um because there's a bunch of hardware on there that you need to um be able to access, they have libraries, code libraries for different languages, one of which is C Sharp, which is the language I'm most familiar with. And um, so I put the operating system, the Windows 10 IoT Core operating system, so it's a Windows operating system, not a Linux one, on the Raspberry Pi, which is possible because it's specific to IoT, this operating system they built, and will run on an ARM processor, which is what the Raspberry Pi has instead of like an Intel one or an AMD one you might buy that runs an x86 uh, instruction set. ARM doesn't do that, so you need to boil your operating system down into something the ARM understands. So that's what Microsoft did with their Windows 10 IoT Core operating system. So I had Windows 10 IoT Core operating system on my Raspberry Pi with the hat that connected the GPIO with a temperature sensor on it, and I wrote C Sharp to inside of a universal Windows application and put that on there um, on top of that operating system, the Windows operating system, used Seed's libraries, so they make software libraries available through NuGet, if you're familiar with that, which is a package manager, to be able to address the hat and be able to look at the different um, sensors that are attached to it or actuators if you want to like turn a motor or something like that. So I used their libraries inside of my code to access this temperature sensor and read and read the temperature and through the universal Windows application show the temperature of the screen. And that was a project that probably took three weeks real time and probably 10 or 15 hours, give or take, probably less um, to put together. And that was easy. That was the easy part. And I think that's where a lot of people who are getting into physical computing, if you want to call it that, or IoT, it's not connected to the internet, so it's not technically internet of things, but we'll, we'll just say physical computing. I think that's where a lot of people stop, basically, is like they have some wires sticking out of a, a little board and um, it does something cute and interesting, but um, what to do from there? And I've made many projects like that, and I wanted, the reason I created this project is to move beyond that um, stage. And I found that moving beyond that stage is incredibly difficult because the real world is hard. So feel free to jump in and ask any questions so far. There's a second half to this story, but that's like the first half. <laughs> well, um... I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's that's the problem. I mean, but you have to be persistent if you want to make it. And that was kind of my next question. Is there a possibility of making IoT, like tinkering around and making it into a, some kind of an enterprise or business or like expanding it or like printing those boards or making something that you can use like down the, down the road? So, Well, let's put the Bronco projects 
on the on the podcast shelf, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, finish that story in a little bit. Um, so I, like you're saying in your intro, I organize a meetup in Orlando, the Orlando IoT meetup. I have help with that. Um, shout out to Garrett Curtis and Al Rodriguez who helped me with the meetup. Um, they would also be great podcast uh, people if you ever want to talk to them. Definitely. Well, we'll, put, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, yeah, definitely. I always want to shout out them because they do, they're do. they extremely helpful and it's not a single person project anymore. It used to be, but anyway... So the last meetup we had, we had somebody who I was very excited to have talk because he started with a side project. Um, he connected his alarm system, his home alarm system, which had been defunct. Like he no longer paid the monthly fee or whatever to get it to tell him if anything's happening. Um, he found a project online um, to basically <laughs> plug all those wires that stick out of the wall into a node and MCU, which is like a little board you can buy mm -hmm. on Amazon for what, like 15 bucks if you're buying one, $5 if you're buying, or I've heard $3 if you're buying a thousand of them per board. <laughs> so, so anyway, he, he bought this little board, he did the project, but he put his own spin on it because he used languages he's comfortable with. And so he wrote his own code and he put this project on github and it got a lot of interest a lot of stars you know all that's github traction stuff. so yeah so he was like okay well let me put some affiliate amazon links on here maybe i'll make some some dollars on the side um and he did not make very much money from that and uh links to their amazon links to all the hardware that he that someone would need in order to make the project and even though he didn't make very much money from it, he saw how many people were clicking the links. And he was like, this is, this is actually a lot of people. This guy's name's Nate, by the way, in case you want to put in your mind a name. So Nate <laughs> said, you know, this is not a lot of money, but it is a lot of people interested in the hardware of this thing. And he started getting requests for like, can you just put all the hardware together into a bundle and just send it to me, you know? And so he did. So he started doing that. He, he bought all the hardware, would just package it up and send it to people, and they could build their own system. But then he realized that, you know, based on how many people came to that page and how many people actually ordered the thing that he was building, there may be a market here for people who don't want to try to put a breadboard together or do soldering. Like, so the next logical step in his mind was to take this, and for those who aren't familiar, breadboard is just like a bunch of, uh, you know, how to put that. Basically, you can plug a bunch of different wires in it and wire one thing to another thing and whatever. It's named because people used to use physical breadboards, like bread boards, and mm -hmm. then they'd screw screws into them and use physical wires to wire between the screws. What I did, like a bit of a side story. So in high school, we had electric. It was an electric engineering high school. So it's in Europe. Like they were teaching you like about electricity, and mm -hmm. there was a computer science class, and it was high school. So it's like a themed high school, something like that. So they made us like draw. Um, we got these copper boards, right? So we were like building mm -hmm. like real circuits. So we kind of drew with a, I think it was a sharpie pen. And then we threw it in acid, so then the acid ate away around yeah. it. So, so, and that's, I mean, it looked ridiculous. It doesn't look like anything like a real board, but we made like a simple, uh, I don't know, simple devices that are like changing diodes left and right. Mm -hmm. But that was in high school. And like, I completely forgot everything about it. Like, <laughs> I never touched it like afterwards so, because that was like one year, one class. And it kind of stuck with hey, me. But, learned it, a lot. but yeah. I learned, I mean, but it's pretty cool. I mean, but we kind of also what I would like kind of to bring in next question, I, as far as I can tell, like there are a lot of support, like for different programming languages. I'm really happy for it. So so you can pick, uh, you know, you don't have to be afraid of the programming language if you want to do IoT. So that's yeah. pretty great. There's a great support for that. But what I'm worried about is like like me, I'm, 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 I'm afraid of that hardware in a way. So I'm afraid of all those chips and like thinking and getting mm -hmm. into it. So how steep is the learning curve let's say for for that 
and how easy it is for a developer to get into like IoT. Yeah, I think um, so. One of the issues I see in people trying to get in IoT is like they try to boil the ocean on everything to try to be an expert in everything and innovate in everything. So I'll talk to people who are working on projects and they are like trying to design their own board while writing the software, building their own platform. Like a, that's an extreme example, but I think the easiest way to, one of the easiest ways to, to get started is to like order a, a starter kit that is like Google IoT starter kit and then include your language of choice and or your cloud platform of choice. And I think that that, so for me, it'd be like IoT starter kit, C Sharp, Azure. And like, I'll find something that is relatively cheap and will have probably some pretty good documentation about how to get started. And I think that's a good way to separate the noise and, um, from the signal and, and get your hands in there and do something. Because unless you're doing something, like, it's not going to stick. So, and in the, in the example of, of the guy I was just talking about, Nate, I just want to finish that. He sell, he's sold over a million dollars in revenue on he, this board that he made. And he started as a software developer, and this has been over two years, and he just took it step by step. Build a prototype. You know, got some interest, did a Kickstarter, um, you know, and then hired an electrical engineer that he found and designed a board, had it built, shipped them out, has a store. And I think, like, if you've got a inquisitive mind and you're not afraid of hard work, that route is possible. So, um, yeah. But the easiest way to get started, I think, is, is a starter kit. If you're not interested in solving things other people have done, um, that's when you want to get into brainstorming like a project for yourself. And I think that can be difficult, but really rewarding. Like finding a well-scoped project that solves a problem you have or a problem you're interested in, that makes it so that you, you can stick with it. Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to solve something for yourself, like me with the Bronco, like I am going to stick with this project. I'm not moving away from it even though it's taking me a while, because I do care about the outcome. Which brings me back. What happened to the Bronco? Okay, so second half of that story. <laughs> I had a prototype, and <clears throat> I realized that to go from this prototype to actually something that works in the Bronco, I needed to get rid of that sensor that is a humidity slash temperature sensor because uh, it's a little piece of plastic. And the thing, the actual sensor, the sensor I have right here, needs to live in an environment where it can go up to like 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It is going to be wet. It's going to not just be water, but coolant, which, you know, is a little bit more, I don't know. It's different. And then it's got to be able to screw into a certain size of screw threads in my engine block. And if you can see from this example, I know the, People listening can't see, but I'll describe it. Don't worry. Uh, so it's got this like um, well, it's called a well, and it's a little metal piece that the actual sensor slips inside. And then that well, I um, <clears throat> used hardening putty for basically plumbing and, and attached it to a threaded bolt that has a hole in the middle so that I can thread it into the block and then the well will stick down into the coolant and it'll be all waterproof and then the wire just sticks out the back and I got a long enough wire that'll go up to my dashboard. But the thing about this sensor in particular is that it can go up to that temperature and it can be accurate, relatively speaking, within a couple degrees up to that temperature and it can react to changes in temperature relatively quickly and this is a digital temperature sensor. And so I don't have to worry as much about noise because it, it changes the analog temperature to digital right in the sensor. And so by the time it reaches the wire, it's sending zeros and ones and zeros and ones can't be corrupted like an analog signal, 
you know, just like a, a radio and think about an AM radio and you hear all that noise, same things happen if you have an analog sensor. <laughs> so was the Bronco overheating in the end or not? So um, right now, this sensor, I'm only able to read it if I type a command in the Raspberry Pi. So I need to change, what I need to do is automate that part and read that um, same command over and over again and then send that data to a screen and or um, the cloud. And that part will be easy. This part has taken so much of my energy. Figuring out what sensor and figuring out how to read it has taken so much of my time and energy because there's a million options out there for, for temperature sensors. They all have their pros and cons. Some are digital, some are analog. Digital ones have different protocols. And this sensor right here, I had to, to put a physical um, daughter board basically between the Raspberry Pi and it so that it could change protocols from something called one wire that's coming from the sensor to I2C, which is what I can read from the Raspberry Pi because I can't read one wire directly from the Raspberry Pi if I'm using Windows 10 IoT Core and C Sharp. <laughs> yeah. So this is not easy. Once you get past the prototype stage, this is difficult stuff. And I think um, if you tell someone other than that, it's a lie. So. But let, yeah. let me put let me put it like this in this form. Knowing what you know now, knowing what you learned by now with this whole entire project and with everything, would you rather take it to a mechanic and never done this thing? Oh, or no. would you do the same thing? So, I mean, looking back, obviously, knowing what I know now, I would be in a much different position right now. But the only way that I know what I know now is having gone through the process. So, of course, I don't regret anything. This is the first project that I've done for myself that I'm trying to do something difficult tip to tail that includes a lot of hardware includes a real world scenario and you know it's it's challenging but i'm learning a lot about each part of building an iot project <laughs> that's great i mean it's all about the learning experience i mean uh, to yeah. me like i always try to learn something new right i'm always like trying to keep and i'm forgetting old things so i'm like rereading old stuff so i'm rereading some of the books i read before even in my university days, I'm still rereading them and like, oh, catching myself like, oh, I forgot something. And I'm always about that learning path. So it's like you need, you know, you need to keep sharp. I mean, it's not if you want to succeed, if you want to improve yourself, it's always that uphill battle mm -hmm. right, toward, towards everything. This is a great talk, I have to say, like, I'm really enjoying it. And um, um, the question is because we're running a bit long now, so we're, we're gonna kind of bring it to some kind of a finisher. Uh, do, um, so let's see, do you educate other developers? Yes, you do. I mean, you hold the IoT meetings. So how are they um, reacting to you? Are you getting like a fan base? Are you building like, uh, Oh, a lot of fans. I'd like to, I don't know if fan's the right word, but I do think that there's a lot of people, we're building a community is what it is. I, I think I see a lot of the same faces um, month to month, and I see a lot of new faces. And when it comes to meetups, like the more consistent you can, as an organizer, as an organizer, the more consistent you can be, the more, people tend to show up. So I've been really fortunate to have those a uh, couple of people helping me out because we've been more consistent than I have been on my own. And so um, I see some very exciting things happen when people come and talk to each other. Like people lend information to each other. Uh, there's experts in different areas. You know, it's, it's the reason why I do it. The reason why I organize the Orlando IoT Meetup is because I want to be around other people doing really cool things and help those people and have those people help me self-servingly. And so um, 
you know, I think that's what community is all about. And that's what I see. I see not fans because that's one directional, but, but a community where everybody benefits, like we elevate each other. So it's really cool. So your schedule is very busy. I mean, you are doing eight hour job, a day, eight hour a day job or 40 hours a week. And you hold talks almost every day or every week, at least I catch you like somewhere, you know, giving a talk. How do you organize yourself? And on the side, you also do the Pronco project. So how do you manage all of those things? Like, do you, <laughs> how um, do you organize yourself? Get a good night's sleep. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, sort of a joke, but you do, you know, I used to push myself to the point of like being exhausted. And I think I can do more now just being um, concentrating on what I'm doing at whatever time I'm doing it. So like my typical day, um, you know, I'll wake up at 6.30, but that's only because my lovely little pug, his name's Carl, he's like 14 years old, uh, but he <clears throat> he gets up that early and starts yelling at me about food. So <laughs> that's why I get up that early. I would not get up that early normally. Um, and then I usually, now I'm trying to get into the habit of spending an hour working on something like a side project for myself. Um, and the reason why is because in the morning I feel like I'm sharpest and I can, I never feel motivated to do that when I come home from a long day of work. So, um, I'm rather than, way. yeah. <laughs> so rather than spending like an hour on my phone or whatever, I'll spend an hour, working on something that I want to do and then I get ready, go to work, um, you know, eight thirty nine, get into work. And basically what I try to do throughout the day at work is when I'm, when I am being disciplined about my time, I have an app on my phone that will turn off my phone basically, or, um, it's called forest tree or something like that. And <clears throat> what it does is it makes me realize like, okay, now my brain, it, it triggers me to be in work mode for a certain amount of time, usually about 25 minutes at a time. And that's enough time for me to, to stop procrastinating, get into whatever I'm doing and concentrate on it. And I think that those times of concentration are super valuable. And if you have junior devs in your audience that have their phones sitting beside them while they work and are constantly like getting notifications. I'm going to sound like a geezer, but that's like the worst thing that you can do for your ability to get things done because constant interruptions are, you turn around and where has the day gone and you don't know, and that's bad. And it's much better to, even though it's hard to get into it, like get into it and feel satisfied at the end of the day of a really hard one work day of a lot getting done and then go home and relax or go home and be on a podcast, which is what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a perfect, perfect thing. I mean, I'm catching myself as well. Like I'm you know, reading a message or something like that. And then I go back in the code review and I was like, where was I? I don't even yep. know. Let's start it all over again. So you're kind of constantly resetting yourself. You can't get into kind of throws you off the path. So I completely agree. Um, what is the last thing you learned? Like off the top of your head, like, something new you learned like it doesn't have to be like big or small it, it can be anything so. <clears throat> so i'm learning a lot about powershell right now and it's newer <laughs> to me and i think it's extremely powerful and i wish i had known about it a while ago i just thought powershell is like a sys admin thing like oh if you're you know if you manage a data you know a data center like you need to know powershell but Scripting languages um, like PowerShell are crazy cool and can do a lot with a very little amount of code if you're trying to solve the right problem. And so that's what I've been learning a little bit. I've been getting to the point now where I'm comfortable writing like a 50 line PowerShell script. Like before I was like, I can't write two lines. And then at some point it clicked. And um, now I'm with them with a lot of help from Google still um, <laughs> able to sit down and like write something that does something. And it's very cool. Well, Google did a lot of things like for computing. 
like I have to say for programming, it did a lot. Yeah. But yeah, especially I spent a lot of time on Google as well. I mean, that's how I, I even search like rudimentary stuff. I mean, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Like, you know, sometimes I forget. Like, you know, yeah. I just refresh my memory. I'm like, oh, okay, that's how you do. Like SQL queries, for example, the other day, I couldn't remember like that insert query or something like that, how exactly it did it go. So it was just like, oh, that, that's how it goes. Refresher and go. So. Yeah. I and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Like and and you shouldn't be. No one should be. Like you know, use use it to to your advantage, but don't use it as a crutch. Or yeah, crutch. if you feel like um, you know, I think some of the core things I work on. If I like C sharp, if I'd never picked up a book about C sharp or tried to watch a video series about C sharp, I would be googling it all the time. And because I, you know, got the foundational knowledge, like. It's only when I'm trying to do something kind of edge case in that language that I need to Google something. And so if you have something you want to work on a lot, a lot, like it's worth stop Googling everything and, and pick up a book, you know, <laughs> like pick up a book yeah. or watch a course or, you know, plural site course or a learning educational course, because it'll be worth it to have that foundational knowledge. Yeah, I, I'm rambling on lately, like about the clean code book that I'm reading by Robert C. Martin, so Uncle Bob, otherwise known as the community. So that's like, oh my God, that's, you know, to me, that's my like Bible. That's where I learned like all of the basics and how to write code and all of my code reviews kind of based on that. So I, I've got one. It, you said what I learned lately. This isn't like super recent, but it's so like the most important software book I've read this year. And it's called Accelerate. And that book, is all about DevOps and the process of developing. And if you feel like your shoes are stuck in mud whenever you're developing, you feel like there's a lot of technical debt, you feel like you're getting yelled at because the feature you're working on is not in production when it should have been two weeks ago. Not you, but if you feel personally attacked, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> but the That's audience, awesome. that pick up that book because that will tell you a lot of the foundational knowledge about why that's happening and how to make it stop. And it uses scientific, like it uses research studies. I don't know if it's a social science, but they're using research studies to show how different teams perform and what makes some teams perform extremely well and give a lot of value back to their business and what teams are falling behind. And so Accelerate, great book. Please go pick it up. That's the second source I heard about that book. I definitely got to read that. So, I mean, it's on my queue as well. There are a lot of books on my queue. It's like piling up lately, <laughs> like, but I got to got to save time. Usually I use my like uh, lunch breaks when I bring my lunch like with me. And then I like, you know, sift through a book and like learn something new and kind of keep sharp on that. But, you know, we, we rambled on and off. It's believe it or not, it's been an hour. So, yep. so I, I mean, so am I. And I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, where can people find you? Okay. Um, am I able to plug and or ask for something at this point yeah. in the podcast? Okay. Yeah, sure. So sure. the easiest way to find me is my Twitter at J P O R C E N A L U K at gmail.com. And I trust someone can rewind that. Um, <laughs> Or you can do J P O R C E N A L U K at Gmail if you want to email me. And we'll put it in the show notes. So sure. Yeah. Um so what I'm hoping to hear from you, the audience, is your experience with IoT. And I'm looking to put together a IoT foundations course and i really could use information from people about what their experience has been like and learning not just in iot but in other things but especially if you're a software developer who has done a little bit with iot or is interested in iot i want to hear from you so that that would be extremely helpful if, if people want to reach i out think to it would also be helpful like for them to express like their fears or suggestions or what they would want to learn and how they would want to learn. Yeah. And they should make it like from the software development side so they can, um, yeah. you know, get into that world. I want to get into that world. And I'm like, you know, feeling 
like, yeah, I know I can code, but I don't know if I can do this thing. So that's exactly so, what I would like to learn. So. If you reach out to me, Marco, you can still reach out to me for this. Um, I would love to have like a half hour conversation with you. And if you want, if you're in the Orlando area, we could do it over coffee. But that basically, that's what I'm trying to do is, is talk with people and ask them some questions about that. Yeah, uh, I'll be interested and I'm sure other people will. So thank you uh, again for taking time away from this. This was extremely fun. I really enjoyed it. And I'm probably going to bring you one more time, like later down the road, like if you want to. So it's like to talk more about this, but because it's a big topic and we just, I feel like we just like scratched the surface and I didn't want to go like for two to three hours long podcast. So I just want to keep it contained yeah. like to, to an hour, but we can split it up and we'll see what people are interested also as well. So send me suggestions also to me at Marco at back and bear .com. But, um, and we can uh, organize something that you guys like to hear about. And thank you again. Thank you again so much for uh, spending some time with me. More than happy to. I really, it was, this has been really fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's been all for today. And uh, hope you have, you're having a great week. And then until next week, ta-da. And this is Marco from the future. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Back and Bear podcast where we talked a lot about IoT, we talked about the Bronco project, and we talked a bit about software development as well. If you want to find out more information about IoT and you're in the Orlando area, go to meetup.com and look for the Orlando IoT group and request to join in. Also, if you're interested in starting your own group of IoT in, in your own town, uh, feel free to contact Jerry at jporsonalik at gmail.com. And don't worry, I'll put all the contact information in the show notes. You don't have to memorize it or spell it out, especially with my bad accent. But anyway, uh, the next meetup would be on July 10th in Orlando, and it will be kind of a lightning talks uh, meetup. So if you're interested and you're in the area, feel free to drop by. There's also a video of this interview that you can check out on my YouTube channel, Back and Bear. And you can leave a comment there or like and subscribe. Now there's no one there, so feel free to go there. It's brand new. And that's it. I hope it was as enjoyable for you to listen to as it was enjoyable for me to make it. And until next time, ta-da!